My goal of my work is to bring awareness without smacking you in the face. Welcome to a special episode of Responsible Impact. We normally discuss all things sustainability and e-commerce, you know the drill. But today, you'll hear our in-person, but socially distanced, interview with the artist Dodd Holzapple. He found smashing success in the 1990s for his sculptures of plants cased in glass. Then he hit the pause button. During an intentional transition period, Dodd moved from sculpture to painting, and we at Magic Links were fortunate enough to see his re-entry into the public eye up close and personal. For some background, Magic Links shares our office building in Venice with Budman Studio, a really magnificent oasis of art and expression, all orchestrated under the watchful, loving eye of the Jim Budman himself. Dodd took up a 12-day residency in Budman Studio this fall and shared his work with whoever popped by, including the Magic Links crew. This interview was in that workspace, as the last of the masking tape had come off to reveal a triptych of layered, interwoven paint on custom canvases. Each image speaks to the ocean, to graphs about air quality, hello wildfires, and <laughs> to the interplay between humans, beauty, and what we leave in our wake. These are not paintings you look at. These are paintings you fall into and then realize are themselves looking at you. Art openings and normal events are out of reach for most of us during the long crawl that is 2020. So I hope this special interview with Dodd brings you a sense of connection, complete with room audio and street noise, footsteps. Our conversation begins with Dodd, inviting me in for a closer look at the canvas. Yeah, do you, do you notice, uh, you, you, you actually haven't gone very close. Mm -mm. Come with me. Uh -oh. <laughs> so there's actually embedded, there's embedded shapes. So th these are all hand cut. There's 89 shapes per canvas, and I, I hand cut them all. So there's, these are reflection shapes. They're shapes of a, of a reflection on water. And they, get, and they scale down as it goes up. And so they're larger here, so I'm creating a sense of scale, just very, very stylized. And then there's, yeah, there's even a cloud-ish type of a shape that's uh, at the top. So this could kind of be the horizon line here or the distance. So there's a lot going on. There's, I even put crackle medium into the center here to, to crack the background just a little bit across, the, across this intersection. So there's just a lot of small ambient things that are going on as well. It's all about surface quality. Mm -hmm. Yeah, talk to me about the doily. Uh, I found a box of old doilies um, uh, months back. A neighbor, a friend of mine called me. He's like, "Hey, my neighbor's moving out of this house. His great grandmother, you know, was there, and there's all this great furniture." He knows I'm a chair freak, like Jim, so I have a bunch of chairs. <laughs> so I drove over there, and all the chairs were garbage, you know. And but then I found this box of doilies, and then I pick up this box of doilies. And everybody's like, "He is the weirdest guy." I'm like, "This box of doilies," and they're like, "What about the chairs?" I go, "No, no, no, the doilies." <laughs> right. So I try to incorporate in my work things that are a little bit like not so hip anymore. So I really am on the lookout for non-hip type things and I embed it into my work to give them a new reason. But the, the concept behind a doily is such an interesting concept because it's a proper tea party or you know, having some, a very, very proper meeting or a very proper group uh, you know, hangout, you would have a, a doily set up, right? These shapes that you, you talked about, mm -hmm. did, were those sort of like, was based on anything specific or like yeah of kind? Th this this whole this whole thing and getting to Jim is a, is a show that got canceled I, I, I was gonna do a major exhibition uh, I haven't shown it in a very long time I've been very quietly working in my studio for years and um, I had a large show happening in Long Beach uh, it was kind of a re-emergence of myself into the art scene again so the show was called water so I was dealing with water all kinds of water concepts and I started to just cut out uh, water shapes so this, this whole, there's a bunch of paintings at my shop. They're all 20 by 20. It's about 60, 20 by 20 inch paintings. And um, that was the, going to be the water show. So the water show uh, came apart and then this came from it. Did you use specific paints that are going to like archive a certain way and that yeah, they're, they're going to age a certain way? Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah, I was taught in art school, you would never do anything without thinking longevity. The very first thing that I was lucky enough to go to a, an art school that was very small at the time, it's quite large now, but it was very small at the time of staff with some professional artists that were teaching, rather than people who were teaching and then being an artist. Uh, and I was taught, I built the canvases myself, they're built 
properly, the campus is all stretched properly. Uh, I did all this myself, so um, I, there's a lot of value placed on that, the longevity of doing something. Why do something if it's not going to last yeah. a long time? Plus, I respect what I'm doing with the, with the concept that it should last a long time. So that's the value placed on it, that I placed on it from the very beginning. So it's a very high level. Of, uh, even, uh, even the canvases, like a normal canvas close to this size would be four feet by six feet. You can go buy those pre-stretched. Each one of these canvases made by Dodd and they're 52 inches by 82 inches. Mm -hmm. So they're just enough. They're bigger than four by six, yeah. which make them really Yeah, the, the, scale, the scale of what you're looking at is not what you're used to seeing. Mm -hmm. So all met already, I've got you at the borders. Exactly. Right? So you're, you're, you're already pulled in by the border or the framework of the painting, which is already outside of the norm. So it, it all starts to feel comfortable because the scale is, is a, a very comfortable scale that you're working. LD was at my shop watching um, several months back and she was like, I don't know how you're making all these decisions so quickly. I, I normally paint in multicolor. I have paintings at my shop. Jim, you saw a little bit of them, but yeah. now that you know more, you'll, when you go back, and you've seen it, but, I, but I, this is more of a monochromatic palette, difficult in the fact that I have to keep making a new glue, and the only way you can do that is by adding, mixing more glues together, so some of those bars have like six or eight different blues mixed together very subtly to make a new blue, so it's a different blue, but at my shop I'm painting in every color, every single color is on the, is on the table, so I'm choosing something really quickly, and, and Elanita watches, Elanita is somebody that's also helps with my books and helps with PR and stuff. And uh, she's like, I don't know how you're putting these colors. She was an art director in New York for 40 years. And so she, she's like, I don't know how you're putting these colors, these colors together because they're not supposed to work. Like, it's not supposed, that color's not supposed to be with that color. Well, any, anytime you walk into an artist uh, studio, and again, it's, it's a real pleasure having you guys around like this. And Jim knows what I'm talking about. Um, it's, it's a very vulnerable situation uh, because you are stepping inside someone's head, especially if th this is an event, so it's less so uh, uh, standing inside my head, but inside my studio, my head is literally like completely split open and laying all around the room, right? So uh, there's that understanding when you do step into that space that it is kind of like this moment where you're, where you're accessing an artist who's let you in, knowing that it's a vulnerable moment. So, um, you know, uh, uh, understanding that you're in that atmosphere as a visitor, and then having that, you know, respect, even if you distest, even if you hate the work or not, you know, you wouldn't react that way, obviously, you know, there, you know, you, but uh, uh, because it is, a, it, is a, it is kind of a very special moment. So doing, doing this with Jim and allowing people to see the process and how I put this together, um, you know, it is, it is a very vulnerable moment because there's a bunch of pieces that make up this whole, uh, this whole move about 250 moves per canvas. It's everything including the moving tape and adjusting and, and all the color layouts. And like at one point we counted, I had 41 unfinished bars and I knew that there was gonna be five to eight different blues on those bars. So just alone, that many blues have to be made. And then that many times of, of stepping to the canvas times that many moves. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So when you think about it, like most people go like, I have 41 places to still deal with and I have to make eight blues per space? You know, forget it, right? <laughs> it's like, well, no, just get started. Just make one and then now you have one less. <laughs> the, the amount of analogies to just, to just life within these paintings is, is unbelievable. Yeah, right. like, and, how, and how you were saying that how you do how you're doing it and you're like oh the um the you know the vulnerable space of, of not of looking at an unfinished product right but it is finished in your mind in to, my mind to where it is mind to yes, for today that's and right that's, that's right. like finishing a day and being done with it right. like okay i can you know admire and love or or detest that day for what it was but then the next day is new and then right. i do it over again that's right. you just do it over again it's a, it's a, and, and me talking to people at, the, at my shop that have encountered me like working on a painting, like, how, how are you like working through this? I go, it's because it's one step at a time. I've broken it down to a bunch of micro decisions and I just keep making a, a very educated micro decision and then it just keeps forming correctly. It just keeps 
moving along this level and it gets better and better and better. What felt like the biggest risk? Wow. Hmm? What felt like the biggest risk? Oh, the biggest risk on these was, uh, was the color shift. Was, uh, I, I, after day three that I was here, I was just trying to think, I, I always try to up the ante on myself uh, and I like pressure. Uh, so I was trying to figure out how to marry the paintings together, even though it was going to be a, like this was going to be in a true blue value. This was going to be in an upscale value with pearl and white, and that was going to be in a downscale value, like with Prussian blue and indigo blue. I already knew that was going to happen. So as I was working through it about day three, I thought, how can I up the ante and marry these paintings together? Because not only in the work, I'm thematic in the philosophy. Um, I never signed any painting until it's sold, so, but I heavily document the back. So there's going to be all kinds of stuff written on the back of this, like what you have been talking about and what things that Michael knows. And, and there's subtitles for these paintings and all this, all this intertwining stuff um, that gets documented on the back. But, so I made that mini bar. I made that really thin bar. I was like, okay, I'm going to make a thin one. And I'm, I'm going to do something on it. So as I was thinking about it, I said, okay, what I'll do is at the very, I'll save that bar to the very end, and then I'll jump each painting to the right. So the light value painting jumped over into the dark value one, and I pulled those thin, light blue stripes. I jumped the dark one back to here, and then I moved the medium blue value to here, just in the last set of bars. So it was, it was a super, connected. Yeah, so now they're completely connected. Completely connected. Yeah, they were made together, and now you know they were made together. Even if they get separated and they go on their own way, uh, it'll be very interesting and very funny in the future. Uh, you know, I, I, it's like this vision, you know, like, uh, you know, uh, lost treasures discovered, you know, the two paintings have been found, but the third one finally surfaced today, you know. <laughs> uh, in nice. an attic in Omaha, <laughs> right? right? Yeah. yeah. By the way, we, we've already decided that wherever the three paintings do go, you know, they have to be like documented in their homes or wherever they end up, you know. Right. Yeah. People need to keep an eye on it. Yeah. They get their hands on all three of them. They have again. to follow where each painting <laughs> It's like adopting a pet. Yeah. You know, where they end up, you know? <laughs> but so okay, far, but I think they're going to be pretty good home. Pretty yeah. good home. I but appreciate but, it. But yeah, but I, but I love things like that. Like, eventually, if they ever do get back into it <laughs> together, it, it's a very cool fact to go, oh, wow, look, they shifted. And need this one little move. And that was the risk. I had no idea it was going to work. And no one was here. I, I didn't want anybody here when I made the decision. Uh, uh, Elanita was here. And, uh, and she was like, oh, I don't know. And I go, well, I go, here we go. And I, and I said, the, the hardest one to pull off is going to be that one. Because the jump is going to be the biggest jump. So I, I put a couple of straps on there. And, and uh, you know, I, I looked back at her and I said, no, oh, yeah, it's, yeah, it's definitely going to work. It actually made the paintings better. Mm. Do you ever name your paintings? Uh, yeah, this is, well, the, I work in series. Uh -huh. uh, so this is the Pacific series, and the Pacific series, there's a bunch of different Pacific series paintings. I have ones with fish. Uh, I'll show you a picture of the fish ones. Jim, you saw the fish yeah, ones over the studio. Yeah. They're, they're full color, and they're, they're, they're all endangered fish species. Um, this is, in particular, Pacific Reflections. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, is, this series is called Reflections. That's Reflections 1, 2, and 3, Roman numeral. And subtitled, that's 6.30 a.m., noon, and 7.30 p.m. Uh, and again, there's another sub-reference, because I'm crazy like that. I apologize. It's, it's super We random. love those references. <laughs> <laughs> but 7.30 p.m. is a new series I haven't started yet. So this one is actually introducing another series called 7.30 p.m. That's not so crazy. That's stem. an Easter egg. Kind of, yeah. It's going to yeah. stem from this painting number three. It is going to come off of painting number three. So they're all, they're all connected. Everything I do is woven together, like these pieces are all woven, and uh, it's all intertwined. And I, without having seen any of your other work, this makes me wonder, like you're, you're almost kind of coming at it like an engineer. Do you think that you approach everything with this kind of structure, or was this the first time that you really like took it to that level? No, I approach everything with, with structure. I have, um, uh, I'm, I'm known for my sculpture work in the 90s, so I, and Jim saw one over at my studio. I used to encase plants in sheets of glass. I used to grow plants between sheets of glass. They were extremely popular in the 90s. I've been on A&E and documentary and published all over Architectural Digest. And, and so uh, sculpture was very easy for me. So I, I was 
I like things hard, I guess, and a lot of people get upset with me about that, but uh, my parents, but <laughs> I was like, okay, I'm gonna paint, and I just, I have a degree in painting, but I've never, I've really never liked my painting. So I kind of just stepped off a cliff. I think painting is one of the hardest things to deal with. It took me a long, it did, this took me longer than I thought. This took me a couple years longer than I thought it would take me to figure this out. This is serious. But it, but, and the three of these took, well, we're at day 12? Day 12? Yeah, I executed these paintings in 12 days. 12 wow. days. But, th but this is my style. So I, I wanted to develop a painting style that, that nobody else is doing. Um, I'm a Southern California contemporary artist and I'm owning that. And being, being a Southern California artist, obviously you gotta be connected to nature because we're in it. And, uh, and color, it's all about color being uh, an artist that works in Southern California. That's, yeah. that's what it's about here. Yeah. And, and obviously I'm a contemporary artist. Uh, that I know that as my definition or defining uh, what I'm trying to do. So once I set those many parameters of what I know I am, then okay, so how do I translate that into a painting? And uh, we were talking about that and, and you had you know you had that great com comment earlier. How do you stop somebody these days? H how, do you, how do you make a painting that you look at once and then you just like walk away and you go, oh okay, that's fun. But you don't want to come back and look at it again. Okay, well I did that for a while. I made some paintings and I would look at it once and I go, okay, I don't really want to see that one again. And so how do you how do you get there? How do you how do you captivate somebody? How how do you put so much into it that it doesn't come apart or make fun of the viewer too much or just make you go, oh my god, it's too much for me to see? Or how do you go like, wow, that's really nice? And then you go, well, wait a minute. You know, back when I first started working as an artist, one of my very first shows was the Exxon Valdez spill. Uh, and I, I was a I was a getting ready to graduate uh, with a painting degree. And um, I actually took a canvas, covered it in tar, and then painted on top of it. And then when I hung it up, as it got warm, it started to slide and, and, and move. So it was whole th the whole thing about- The whole know, commentary, yeah. Yeah, whole commentary about artwork. So the reaction was, everybody was like, oh my, everybody really got it. And, and, and even though the Exxon Valdez spill was covered, the extent of how bad it was, was really never covered. And then of course we have the event horizon that, you know, that, uh, that disaster makes Exxon Valdez spill look like a tiny accident, like a can spill. But uh, people really never, you know, it comes and goes and people are like, oh, well, you know, it's not my backyard. So these things, these are complicated things and, and the answers take a collective group of people, uh, you know, trying to get involved to, to fix those things. So uh, I, I'll show you some pictures of the Pacific series that's dealing with the fish. That, that Michael has seen, and uh, um, fishing, I, I was a very avid fisherman. I would bring home the fish and we would eat it, I would give it to all of my friends. Uh, now I don't, uh, I, I went through a period of time where I was fishing and felt guilty, uh, because I've seen the reduction of the fish species. I've seen it change like incredibly, to the, to the point now where I know for a fact it's not sustainable. It is actually probably past the point of being able to be repaired. Um, farm-raised fish and stuff like that is going to cause problems. Here we have COVID. All this farm-raised stuff is actually going to cause the potential for a disaster happening in a farm-raised environment like that is is very dangerous as well. When you when you don't have that habitat, you know I spend a lot of time going to Japan, and you think about entire entire nations that involve on seafood that that exist off the ocean, and literally, what are they going to do? You know, what are they going to do? Japan doesn't have enough uh, land to grow enough food for the people who live in Japan. So, uh, you know, I mean, it's, I don't, the, the answers to these questions need to be, they, people have been talking about them for years, but no one's doing anything about it. So I, in these paintings, I think I was mentioning to you before, these are not currents to me. These are not waves, this is not the air, these are graphs. Charting danger or charting, charting things that are becoming a problem. So I, I spent a lot of time looking at graphs and scales and, uh, and seeing how they affect us in everyday life. When we were looking at the fires, I, looked, I, I, was, I was mesmerized by the, by, the, by the smoke, or the air quality graphs that were every day, like in the news, they, oh, these graphs and all these colors, and you know, oh, it's red today, oh, it's gonna be orange tomorrow, you know? So that's actually what's going on in these paintings. So these are actually, these are actually graphs. So these, these are ocean awareness paintings. When you look at it, somebody was here earlier and they were like, oh, I love the rainbows, you know, going through the back. That's fine, you can see whatever you want, but there's more in it if you want it. 
There's a lot more going on here. My goal in my work is to bring awareness without smacking you in the face about it. I don't like art that makes fun of the viewer uh, not for not getting it. Uh, I, and again, one of my foundations in deciding to paint is it has to be beautiful. You gotta really wanna look at it. So, because if, if, if no matter what the message is, if you don't wanna look at it, well then how are you gonna get the message across? But even, even with the color here, uh, there's still a massive amount of color theory and a massive amount of understanding acrylic paints. I had a commercial art business um, for a long time and uh, everything was freehand made. So the brushwork quality that come out of my hands is like 18 years of using a brush to do live murals and understanding what certain brushes do and what they won't do and how they perform and, and my, my ability to move the brush and get different things. Uh, and, and you know, I didn't understand it before, but as it was happening, I started to go, wait a minute, I'm like educating myself with brush and color on this commercial work. And so at my shop in Santa Monica, we would produ produce commercial work during the day and then knock off about three or four and then I would go back to my work and I would be completely warmed up because I've been doing it for hours. <laughs> um, but yeah, right now there's about 10 running series. Uh, Jim wants me to do something in here. There's a new series that I'm thinking about introducing. It's, a, a, it's an entirely new series. I believe it's gonna be Landmark. It has to do with uh, uh, Greek and Roman time in the same technique. Uh, so it's something that I'm spinning around. Uh, another ongoing series is for Exotica that I've been painting for about 10 years. It's uh, normally endangered flowers uh, in the same practicing format. Uh, I have about uh, maybe 50 of those paintings done at the moment at this, in my shop. Uh, they're very thematic. Um, I'm starting to get geographical now with, with the process and it's really starting to, uh, to spread out. And so if you're finishing something like this, but you still have various stages, like uh, developmental phases of these other projects, does, does something about these being done shift anything in the ongoing project? So they're all evolving sort of concurrently. That's right, and they all affect each other. Yeah. They all affect each other. Where do you hope they end up, like they, they live and they end up? Um, I, I hope my work winds up in the hands of people that, uh, that really want it uh, and, uh, and kind of are passionate about it. I have to say they're really, they're like all the things. They're busy but still, right? They're bright but quiet. It's, it's, it's really surprising to see something that can be so many things all at once. You should just really... An accomplishment. Right? Thank you. I am an avid supporter of chaos theory, <laughs> and that's that's I, I very much support the theory of chaos and the beauty and chaos. Yeah, it's all happening at once. Now, thank you for seeing that. That and thanks for sharing that because oh, yeah. it's what I've really tried to do. Yeah. And uh, no, nothing nothing in here is random. It's all thought out. Everything is thought out. There that's... was there was another comment made as somebody was walking out in the hallway echoes. Uh, somebody made a comment uh, as, um, wow, this is just really simple paintings with a lot of color. And, and I, la I was in here and I la when I heard it, I started laughing. And I said, that's fine. You th I hope you think that because the complexity in here is enormous. Yeah. It's really off the charts. But I, sometimes some things like that, they say more about the viewer than the... Absolutely. Right? Absolutely does. And, and again, it's, it's very helpful. I, I'm not negative in any way. If someone could come in here... And, and attack me and tear me down, it doesn't phase me and it, it doesn't make me react back to the person that way. These are also problems that you have with the environment. To be able to fix the environment, you can't fight. You can't have a fisherman saying, well, I've been fishing my generation after generation. Okay, well, that's great, but something's gotta change now. So you're gonna have to be, if you are a fisherman, you're active, then you're gonna have to figure out a way to do that. You know, you're gonna have to figure out a, a sustainable way to do that. Uh, you know, even even portion sizes. Portion sizes need to scale down. We've been so, you know, some some portion sizes are obscene, and uh, you know, you can even think about it that way. Um, uh, interesting thing for me, there should be no such thing as lobster on sale, or, or or scallops on sale. You know, if you can't, if it's if it's something so exotic and something that is being uh, taken from the environment at a, at a scale where uh, it it can't be, then it should be expensive. If you can't afford it, then you can't eat it. Yeah. Oh, it's, to me, that's very logical.
everybody has to work together. Obviously, the tipping point has already happened. Whales are not going to be able to recover. They're, they're never going to be the numbers they were before, and maybe they are past the point of even maintaining a, a healthy level. But at some point, it obviously has to stop. You know, I mean, the, the atrocities with sharks, all that stuff is just insane. Uh, shark fin soup, I don't understand. No. Uh, the idea of eating something and gaining the power of something, yeah. to me, is just, uh, I mean, I know it goes back centuries in some cultures, but I don't know how you can educate that out of people that you don't, uh, you know, you can't get sexual performance from eating a lion. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how you change those things. But all that stuff needs to be on the table somehow. And unfortunately, we're, the time it takes things to change, which we're seeing, uh, you know, social unrest and things, it has to happen to force change. I don't think we have the time to force environmental, the environment is already past the point to take the time to allow it to slowly change. Yeah. I think it has to be rapid at this point. I mean, we're really, actually, we're not fighting to save anything anymore. We're like saving, we're fighting to get people to think better. We're fighting ourselves. Like the, the fight is against people who insist that they have a right to think in a way that harms sure. those around them. You mentioned being a sculptor, and you do have a very three-dimensional approach to painting. Is that intentional, or do you yeah. think that if you didn't have that background, like? Do you have any plans to make any paintings that are really just like flush, or do you always want to work with the texture? And is that a carryover from sculpting? Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a technique as well. It's a technique that I've discovered that actually works for me. In the in the way that I approach painting, and the way that I want paint to move, mm -hmm. and the way that it works for me. Mm -hmm. Th this is a this is how paint, brushes, structure, visual elements all work for me. And I love the idea of looking at something from a distance and then getting close and seeing that there's surface quality. To me, surface quality is everything. So now that I've heard you, you talk, it feels like these are the first times you've finished paintings and they feel fully, truly honest uh, for in you. The, in this particular series, yes. Yeah, this is, this is legitimate contemporary art and it's current because it, there's all more pieces. So you're, un, you're unraveling more pieces of the puzzle. Mm -hmm. It's 2020, look, look, look at things right now. Look at how complex life is. It's an international community. These are international decisions. This is not an individual world anymore. This is not World War I where countries kind of existed, you know, on their own. Now everyone's connected. Credits this episode go to Hazel Shin, Brian Nickerson, Jim Budman, and Dot Holesapple. His art can be seen at dodholesapple.com. That's D-O-D-D-H-O-L-S-A-P-P-L-E.com, including the series discussed in depth here. All right, I'm Natalie, and I'm out. Till next time.